I'm just really glad to be here with you and to be able to share with you. And I know that Doug had his hopes up that I was going to say exactly the same thing I said before, and it's not. But the good parts are in there. The good parts are. So history of the restoration movement. Some of you are going, why couldn't we just wait till breakfast? You know, why do we have to... (laughs) Why do we have to come and listen to this? I mean, how is this a way to start off a conference, like to hear about the history of the restoration movement? How do I get out of this? I mean, how many of you are right now playing Candy Crush? I don't know. I'm just wondering, you know. And who are you going to blow the dust off of to stand up here and talk about the restoration movement to me for 45 minutes and get me interested? Let me tell you, I get you. I really do. I remember... Uh, How many of you went to a Restoration Movement Bible College? Raise your hands. So you all had to do this. You had to take Restoration History. I took it at 7 a.m. Had it from a professor whose lips never moved. Like we wondered if he was actually real. (laughs) True story. Anyway, it was murder. And I remember, you know, you had to have that class to graduate. And uh, I mean, really, who cares about a, a bunch of old, crusty historical figures that really aren't relevant anymore, and how can they have anything to do with our church or your role as an executive or whatever part you play, whatever position you play at your church? I'm going to give you one word. I'm going to answer that. And the word is story. Everybody say story. Story. Yeah, so say it like you mean it. I know it's late. (laughs) Story. Story. (laughs) Every one of you has a story right? And you have two versions, at least, of that story. You have the made-for-TV version with all of the expletives out of it and all the stuff that didn't make it, you know, they were on the cutting room floor, but it still happened. You know, some of you, you got the director's cut, but nobody ever shares that. You don't share that. As a matter of fact, that may be off-limits to a lot of people, right? Maybe everyone. But there are other parts that you do share. You call that your testimony, right? And you'll be sharing that here at this event. You'll be telling other people, they'll say, so where where are you from? And what are you doing? And how's it going? And is there anything I can steal from you? Is there anything that I can learn and take back with me? I mean, that's what's beautiful about an event like this is you get the opportunity to network, right? Just like you have a story, every church has one. Every church has a story. It's unique to them. And like your personal life, there are portions in that church story that you're really proud of, and then there's other parts of that church story that you'd rather leave out and maybe have left out. Is that connecting with anybody? Yeah. Every church, just like every person, has a story. I I serve in a church like that, that has a story. I came 21 years ago to that church, and it was at a particularly low spot in the history of that church. There were four staff members. Senior pastor had been there four years. People had gotten pretty excited. The church had gone from like 75 people to 330 people in that four years. <clears throat> had a youth minister, had his wife was the administrative assistant. And then in year four, uh, they decided to become a mobile church. They were going to take new ground. They'd, I remember they made a, uh, a commercial saying, uh, actually with black sheep coming into the church and they said we're a church for the black sheep if you if if other people label you that's who that's who we are that's who we want he hired a lady on staff called her minister of involvement and got involved and his wife caught them and in the space of about 3 weeks after they launched mobile church three of the four staff was gone there was only a youth minister left the only one that survived it About 100 people left in the course of about four weeks. All kinds of disillusionment, you know, like some people said, what's the big deal? I mean, a lot of people that were, you know, brand new to the idea of Christianity is like, you know, everybody does that. I mean, can't we, I mean, aren't we a church that forgives people? Other people were like mad at the guy that they couldn't bring him back, tarred, feather him, you know, do something awful to him. And then there were just people that were just really sad. And I remember when I tried out for the church, when I actually preached my first sermon, nobody looked up. Have you ever been at a church that's so sad that nobody looked up? 
hard to make a connection with people like that. It's hard to get your illustrations to stick. <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning of my experience there, and I can tell you it would be the last place I'd ever really want to go unless I felt like God was calling me there. <clears throat> Didn't have a good reason. The church where I was was bigger, had a bigger building. But I've seen God do incredible things, people. I didn't do it, but God did it, and I got to go along for the ride. April 14th, we're going to launch our 12th campus. It's incredible. <laughs> Praise God for that. Doug's right. Uh, all of those are in communities that are either stagnant or declining. Matter of fact, the place where I serve it was actually literally called, it was in magazines, called Forgottonia. You've heard of like the flyover states? This is like the totally looked over states. Like you don't even know that as a state down there. That's, that's, that's where I serve. That's where God does incredible, miraculous things. It's a place that God has never ceased to amaze me. Right, Ron? That 12th campus is going to be in Jacksonville, Illinois. And uh, for me, it's a place where you could say things have come full circle. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Let me tell you why I changed this talk. And I said, I want to use the word story. Uh, I just had uh, Mel McGowan come last week. And we spent two full days of windshield time while we went uh, to a few different campuses. And <clears throat> I don't know if you know who Mel McGowan is. How many of you have heard of Plain Joe Studios? Okay, well, Mel McGowan runs Plain Joe Studios, and uh, he is a Disney Imagineer, and he has two other Imagineers on staff. He has someone that works uh, worked for Pixar on staff, and so he's this incredibly creative person. He writes an article for uh, The Standard. It's in there every month, and I asked him a while back if he could find some time in his schedule to fly over and just take a look at our facilities and tell us what we're missing. You know, every time you bring somebody that's a complete outsider in, they just raise your IQ like crazy. You have to have some thick skin, though, to be able to manage it. And you have to have a sense of honesty so you can hear it. Uh, but uh, I was just enjoying it because <clears throat> I don't know how you're... I mean, we're like the garage sale version of Willow Creek, okay? We're like, we're like the... You know, the version that if you could do it with backyard items, that's, that's what our, our church is like. And so over the, and you never can do a whole lot uh, because it caught, would cost too much to, to do like something like that's creative all the way across the board. And so our campuses have become kind of a hodgepodge. You go into one area and it looks like this. You go to another area and it kind of looks like that. And everybody thinks their area is cool, but it really doesn't make any sense, you know? And, and, and so we know that enough to know that if we're trying to attract people that are far from God, that uh, we need to be able to kind of sneak up on them in a way and disarm them so that they'll hear the Word of God and they'll respond to the Word of God. And I really felt like uh, He could help us in that area. And it turned out, as I started to understand this guy more, that he really isn't interested in cool design at all. He's interested in something else. Guess what it is? Story. He's interested in story. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to capture that in the church design. Like in things like what you put up on the wall and the kind of chair you're sitting in and the kind of space you get into. He wanted the, the environment to help tell the story. So I took him to Hannibal, Missouri. Actually, I picked him up at Springfield. He flew in Springfield, Illinois. And so I took him by Jacksonville because we're about a month away from opening there. And then I took him to Pike County, which is a building, which is a church that was built in a former pellet mill, like they made corn pellets to go in corn stoves. <clears throat> and then I took him to Hannibal. And every one of these locations, Doug knows, is just like, like, oh, now I got it. No, no you don't. And uh, we went to Hannibal, Missouri. Well, the Hannibal campus is a former Orpheum Theater. It sat 1,200 people uh, at one time. It took four years to build. 
uh, it was like the, the, the jewel. Some of you have been there. You're shaking your head because you're like, yeah, I'm not lying, right? Uh, I mean, the ceiling's 44 feet high and, you know, you got prestige boxes and it's like what everything you would think of in a vaudeville theater it has a 54 foot silver screen that flies. So it means, you know, you, you can lower it down as a fly stage. It's really, really uh, famous people have performed there. It was, it was the crown jewel of that, of that town, of Hannibal, Missouri. And then it fell into disrepair. And then it became like a tragedy, like a Greek tragedy. <clears throat> and uh, we were getting ready for campus five and six. The pellet mill was five. This one was six. They outgrew, we were meeting in the YMCA, they outgrew it. We ended up getting this theater and uh, it was just incredible. We were able to restore the theater, able to do it cheaply. I was so excited for Mel to see that theater. He didn't care one bit about it. <laughs> we're driving into Hannibal. He said, this is where Mark Twain's from. I go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, you know, he goes, Mark Twain, like the Mark Twain. I'm like, yeah. And what he began to share with me is that one of Walt Disney's greatest inspirations was Mark Twain and everything that he wrote. If you go to Disneyland or Disney World, you have Tom Sawyer's Island, you have the riverboat, you have all the river, based, all based on Mark Twain. So I could tell this guy was totally geeking out. Uh, it's about, oh, I don't know, 80 miles, 70 miles away from Quincy, Illinois, if you go straight west toward Kansas City, you'll go by a little town called Marceline, Missouri, and that's the hometown of Walt Disney. So there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting characters that come from this Forgottonian, and uh, Mark Twain was one of them. So I said, well, Mel, do you, wa you want to do you want to take the 50 cent tour? Do you want to really? He go, oh yeah, yeah. And he was so excited. He is like texting his wife. He's taking all these weird pictures. I'm going, this guy's from LA. This guy helped design Animal Kingdom. And he's like geeking out over this stuff. I go, yeah, there's where Samuel Clemens grew up. There's Becky Thatcher's house. And like there really was a Becky Thatcher. Her name was Laura Hawkins. This is where his dad was. This is where the print shop was. They even have the, a, a fence and you can like hold up the fake paintbrush and, and like, you know, get your picture taken painting the fence. So some of you have read Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, right? So anyway, he's going nuts. He goes, I can't believe you don't have like some interactive museum here with animatronics. This says Mark Twain, for goodness sake, this is great. And I started sharing some things to him that caught me about oh, seven years ago, six or seven years ago. See, when we first launched the campus in Hannibal, you're wondering, where am I going to come in the restoration movement, right? I found out that Barton W. Stone died in Hannibal. Now, if you don't know who Barton W. Stone is, you don't know where you got the name Christian Church because he's the one who gave it to you. He's the one that put that handle on you. As a matter of fact, when Alexander Campbell decided to rise up in the movement, he uh, had to shake hands, or they had to shake hands together and join forces. And uh, Alexander Campbell wanted to call it the Disciples of Christ. But uh, Barton W. Stone wasn't having any of that. So the movement... From that day, 1832, to today, it's called Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And there's always been a backslash, right? Christian Church Disciples of Christ. So I went on and I said, I found out that he died in Hannibal. I did a little bit more research. This, I did this all about seven years ago, and I found out where, why he died there. He lived in Jacksonville, Illinois, and there's a reason he lived in Jacksonville, Illinois. I'll get to that in a little bit. And uh, he was 77 years old. He already had a stroke. And he was still pouring into young preachers. He was in Columbia, Missouri. And he got sick preaching to those preachers in Columbia. And he started on his way back. And he made it as far as Hannibal and he couldn't go any further. His daughter lived in Hannibal and his son-in-law. And uh, he died in their house. 
year later, Alexander Campbell came to Hannibal just to stand in that house. And a few years after that, Alexander Campbell came back to Hannibal to preach to the people of Hannibal. There was a young man that uh, was there that day when Alexander Campbell preached, and he wrote, I didn't think there was that many people in the whole world. That was Mark Twain. <clears throat> so I'm telling these stories to Mel. I go, here's something you didn't know. His, uh, when he died, they buried him in Jacksonville. He lived, had a farm in Jacksonville. And if you get on I-72 toward uh, Springfield, you drive right by his farm. You see his house right over there. Still there. They buried him on the farm, but his wife couldn't keep the farm going by herself, so she had to sell the farm. So they had to dig the poor guy up, and then they buried him in the city cemetery in Jacksonville. And then the people in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, wanted him back. So they exhumed his body again, and now he's buried in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. How many of you ever heard of Cane Ridge, Kentucky? Well, you really can't know a whole lot about the Restoration Movement unless you know something about Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Because there was a little young preacher there whose name was Barton W. Stone. And uh, he was a Presbyterian. He was a Calvinist. He believed everybody was elected to be lost or saved, that God made the choices and you didn't. He was just pressing play. Until he heard a guy preach a sermon one day that said, God loves everybody. And it captured his heart. It wasn't deep theology. God loves everybody. And God wants everybody to be his child. Does that re resonate with any of you? That goes back to that guy. And Barton W. Stone decided to have a common communion service at Cane Ridge. And he invited Methodists and Baptists and whateverists there was. And a revival broke out. Cane Ridge is a little north of Lexington, Kentucky. I mean, it's in the middle of the backwoods, and there were only 25,000 people in those woods. And you couldn't control the crowds. All these people were doing all these things, howling at the moon. And... I'm not kidding, they really were. You know, kids sitting on their parents' shoulders, prophesying. I mean, doing everything you're not allowed to do in a Christian church. <clears throat> Barton was trying to figure out how to control it. So he took the benches out of the church and he set them around the trees in the area. And he said, any of you feel moved by God, I just want you to go over there and pray at that bench. Do you know what that was? That was the first time a preacher in a Christian church offered an invitation. Because before that time, nobody did. Presbyterians don't do that. It's not whosoever will may come. It's the ones that have been elected come. And they'll figure it out. And Barton Stone couldn't go along with that anymore. Some of you know a little bit more about the history of the Restoration Movement. Know that he and some of his preacher friends got together and they wrote something called the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery, which was kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, uh, no thanks, guys. They were all getting excommunicated anyway because they wouldn't stop preaching that God loves everybody and Jesus died for everybody, not just the ones that were elected. <clears throat> so Celia sold the farm. That was his wife, 33 years, second wife. His first wife died in childbirth after nine years of marriage. Second wife, 33 years, had six kids together. Couldn't run the farm without him, so she moved back to Hannibal to live with her daughter, Amanda Bowen. Married to Captain Bowen. She died there in 1857 and they buried her. Why am I telling you this story? Because uh, I went looking for a grave. I thought, how cool is this? We got a church here and it's like in this epicenter of the restoration movement. Nobody even knows it. So I'm looking, I'm looking. I finally find it. Found her grave on top of Cardiff Hill. In a Baptist cemetery, it's broken, you can't read it. He had to chalk it to read it. So our church bought her a new tombstone. And I wrote my first article for the Christian Standard called Rediscovering the Sacred Stones. Just because I thought it was amazing. I found out all kinds of cool stuff. I found out that 
Amanda Bowen and Captain Bowen had three boys. <clears throat> and so Celia and her years remaining just loved being with her grandsons. And they had another friend whose name was Samuel Clemens. Turns out that all those stories you read about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn are about Samuel Clemens playing with Barton Stone's grandsons. And if you don't believe me, <clears throat> you can look it up. Because Mark Twain kept in touch with those boys as long as he lived. As a matter of fact, he took the name Mark Twain because of them. They were the ones that taught him how to be a steamboat captain. And Mark Twain, most of you know, is a symbol of depth of water for a riverboat captain. It's where he learned it. Did you know that? Better than that 7 o'clock class with the guy's lips didn't move. <laughs> a little bit better. What am I doing to you right now? I'm telling you a story. It's all about story. That's why Jacksonville comes full circle to me. Because that was where Barton Stone's last days were. You know, back then, in 1844, when he died, the Mississippi River was kind of the edge of the universe. You were in the frontier. If you got on the other side of the Mississippi River, you didn't know if you were coming back or not. And that's what I really love about Stone. <clears throat> there are two reasons, two big reasons, why he left Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And the first one is he wanted to take that story of primitive Christianity and he wanted to take it out on the American frontier. And he wanted to raise up leaders, pray over them and send them out, have them start church locations. And that connects with me. I bet it connects with you too. I bet the reason you're in this room is because you have a passion to reach lost people for Jesus Christ. I bet that's part of your story. I certainly hope you're not in here just because it's a job. I hope you're in here because you're on a mission from God. It connects with me. And that's why I love it where I am. Because I want to take the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ to places that are forgotten and overlooked by other people. That they're not thinking about. And you know what? It's in our blood. It's in our history. It's our story. It's the same thing where you're doing where you are right now. You're writing a story. You have a story. The church that you serve has a story. And you're a part of that story. You're a critical part of that story. But you know what? All of our churches together have a story. And do you know what that story is? It's called the Restoration Movement. So you have a story, your church has a story, and this whole movement houses all those stories together like a great library, alive, full of people who gave all, who gave everything to share the same message, that carried the same passion, bore the same burdens that you do. It's part of your story. So... It connects with me that I want to go places that other people wouldn't go. And I want to reach out the way other people wouldn't reach out. I want to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God. I want them to hear the gospel. and I want Because I know that it changes people. Like for eternity, it changes people. And I want to be an agent of that. I want to be an ambassador of that. There's another reason that Barton Stone left Kentucky. It was a slave state. He was opposed to slavery. And that was not a popular idea at the time. Especially in Kentucky. When I was doing research on Hannibal, Missouri, there's a big difference between Illinois and Missouri if you go back 150 years. Because Illinois was a free state, and Missouri was a slave state. 
And some of you have heard of the Missouri Compromise. That was law. And slave hunters actually had a right, a legal right, to come across that river and hunt slaves in Illinois, and you couldn't stop them. I was doing research in the library. Hannibal, it's an old library. It's only about a block away from the church building. Trying to find out what was truth and what was urban legend, like who actually did perform there. And I was going back through the microfilm and everything. And there was a wonderful African-American lady that was helping me, bringing me the stuff. And I was looking through them. And she started to get inquisitive. She goes, why, why are you wanting to see all this stuff? And I go, well, <clears throat> because... We just bought the theater. Really? You bought that theater? I go, yeah, we bought the theater, and we're going to turn it into a church. Really? She goes, I used to go to that theater when I was a little girl. She goes, we had to sit up on the balcony. Couldn't go into the main doors. Had to go up the side of the building on a steel. Couldn't use the same bathrooms. Couldn't buy any concessions. <clears throat> the way that the building is designed, there's a whole lot more seats up in the balcony than there are on the main floor because there's no leg room. She told me what they called it. I'm not going to repeat it. She goes, do you remember going there when she was a little girl? I said, well, I sure hope you come and you can have any seat you want. I think Barton Stone would have liked that. <laughs> I think he would have. He was opposed to slavery. And he was so opposed to it that he left his church and went to Jacksonville, Illinois. It was a free state. <clears throat> and that matters to me. Many of you know that uh, the Restoration Movement is divided into three streams, Right? The Disciples of Christ, which pretty much has left all truth altogether. Don't believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Might as well stop there. And then the non-instrumental Church of Christ. And then the independent Christian church. Right? <clears throat> There's other components to our movement that we don't talk about as much. Uh, or maybe we don't even know about. And that's what I want to talk to you about right now. You probably didn't know that there is a primarily, primarily African-American Church of Christ. I didn't. Seems that if you go to Bible college for four years, you ought to know that. And I found out about that because of the Solomon Foundation. Found out of that, about that because of a church called Harvest Point. <clears throat> The pastor of that church was talking to me about it, some of that stuff, and I got to talking about it, and he lit up, and we're swapping stories. And it caused me to really dive down deep into that part of our history. And I heard about a man named Marshall Keeble. How many of you heard of Marshall Keeble? You all get the standard, right? That's why. This is, this is Marshall Keeble right here. Now, let me tell you what's so terrible about this. If you knew a man that had won more people to Jesus Christ than anybody else in the Restoration Movement in the history of the Restoration Movement, started more churches than anybody else in the history, history of the Restoration Movement, don't you think you would have studied about him in Bible college? Well, that's him. Personally baptized somewhere around 47,000 people. Anybody? Anyone? <laughs> Started over 300 churches. Started the Nashville Christian Institute so that African American young men and women could learn how to share the gospel. I was fascinated and I was angry. I was angry with myself. And I was kind of angry with the people who taught me. And I remember we had these TSF events, you know, I'd go to these events and I'd see all these people like, I'm not going to name who, but guys that I looked up to and I said, hey, have you ever heard of, no, no. Hey, have you ever heard, no. 
Hey, how about... No, couldn't find one. Not one. Not one in the independent Christian church. Now, Church of Christ, yes. But not the non-instrumental Church of Christ, but not in the independent Christian church. And I thought, what a travesty. Well, you know why? Two reasons. Marshall Keeble was a non-instrumental Church of Christ, and he was black. That's why. I didn't know about him. And you know, we all tend to want to step away, like this is something we really don't want in our story. We want to step away from racism, <clears throat> even an, a racism of ignorance. But there really is such a thing. It's one of the things I just love about Solomon Foundation. You know, these guys have committed over $80 million to build African-American churches of Christ. $80 million. And God is doing incredible work. I think the largest African-American church of Christ in the country is Renaissance, right? And it has its uh, dedication this weekend. Beautiful building in Atlanta. Incredible. And that's when I first learned about this guy. I have something up here. You know, I'm kind of preached like a hodgepodge, don't I? Y'all don't even know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around. I know, I know it doesn't look like much, but I want you to be very careful with it, okay? And take your time and go all the way around. You can all see it, right? All right. Got any ideas? Gary, got any ideas? Uh, not really. How could... What's it look like it's made out of? Concrete. Concrete. You're right. And that white and that brown is paint. What's so valuable about a piece of concrete with white and brown on it? It's a part of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall separated East and West Berlin. It was symbolic of the Iron Curtain in the Cold War. But on June 12th, 1987, Ronald Reagan gave a speech at the Brandenburg Gate with a famous line. And that line, his speechwriters tried to take out five times. He'd write that speech, they'd take it out. They didn't want him offending Mikhail Gorbachev. And the fifth time, he was on Air Force One and he was flying to Berlin. And uh, looked at the speech. The speechwriters had looked, done it over one more time, handed it to him. Once again... That line had been taken out. He called the speechwriter over. The guy came over to the president. He goes, I have, a, I have a favor to ask you. Who am I? He goes, you're the president of the United States, Mr. President. He goes, put the line back in. What was the line? You say it. Mr. You got it. It was Reagan's greatest speech as president. Two years later, it came down. And along with it, the Cold War. And my brother was there to witness and get picked up that piece and gave it to me. That wall was there for 27 years. And let me tell you something. People thought it was impossible. Walls are a real buzzword right now because of our southern border, right? But there shouldn't be any walls between brothers and sisters in the family of God. No walls between black and white. No walls between instruments and acapella. Because all those walls do is limit us. All they do is lower our IQ. It limits our story and it limits their story. 
<clears throat> Did you know you had a hero of faith like that? That's part of your story? Marshall Keeble. See that kid right there? These boys that are sitting around him, Marshall called his preacher boys. And he would travel the country with them and uh, let them preach, teach them how to do what a traveling preacher needed to do. You can pass that around. I've got to have that one back. But here you go. You can't keep it. And the guy that I just pointed out is about 14 years old in that picture. He's a man named Fred Gray. Fred Gray. It's a pretty basic name, right? And he's no basic man. No way. How many of you heard of Fred Gray? I'll read the standard. <laughs> That's Fred Gray. Fred Gray went to the National Christian Institute under the leadership of Marshall Keeble was going to be a preacher. He's from Montgomery, Alabama. Couldn't get an education down there, so he went up there to get his education, his early education. <clears throat> but something happened to him that flipped a switch. He saw and began to understand the truth of segregation. And even though he didn't say it to anybody, Something began to form inside his heart that it was wrong. And he made it his life's mission that he was going to destroy everything segregated he could find. Couldn't go to college or graduate school in Alabama, so he had to go up to Cleveland. And he got his law degree there because he felt like the best way that he could make a difference when it came to segregation was in the practice of law. And then he moved back down to Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, I love this story. You can pass that around. So, there was a little 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin on a bus. And normally, that bus would pick her up from school, and city bus, and it would take her home. Of course, the bus were, buses were segregated. If you were black, you had to sit in the back. And if you were black, you had to give your seat up if it was full to any white patron. But there was always plenty of seats at that time of day, except for this day, Claudette's school got out early. So she had to ride the bus home early. And while she was in her seat that she'd paid for, the bus filled up with white patrons, and she was asked to give up her seat, and she said no. You're thinking of Rosa Parks. Nine months before Rosa Parks was Claudette Colvin. They took her to jail. She needed some help. And so Fred Gray got her out of jail. Started something in his mind. He was uh, volunteering in the uh, Montgomery NAACP youth program. And there was another lady that was also volunteering there, and her name was Rosa Parks. She worked around the corner at a, <clears throat> at a uh, department store from Fred's law office. Every day they'd have lunch together. And they came up with an idea of her sitting in a seat and not giving that seat up. And they thought maybe for one day, for one day, they could boycott, that all of the African Americans could boycott riding the bus in Montgomery, Alabama for one day. So they had a meeting together in a lady, last name of Robinson's house. They were trying to figure out who was going to do this, how they were going to put this whole thing together. They thought about who's going to be the spokesman. And they talked about this one guy, but he was too... He was just too much into just voting rights. Another guy, he was just too much of a political firebrand. They're going back and forth. They really couldn't figure it out. And Fred couldn't do it because even though he was a preacher and a lawyer, 
uh, they would disbar him. So Mrs. Robinson said, you know, we just got a new preacher. He's young, but he can move people with words. I think we ought to use him. Fred goes, well, I've heard of him, but I don't really know him. But if you think he'd be all right, let's do it. You know what his name was? Martin Luther King. He was in Montgomery a long time before he was in Alabama in, in Atlanta. <clears throat> Now, you've heard of the Montgomery bus boycott, and that lasted over 360 days. And you've heard of the Selma to Montgomery march, right? And you've probably heard of the desegregation of Alabama schools. But do you know who argued every single one of those cases? Rosa Parks, desegregation. You know that every one of them went to the Supreme Court. You know that every one of them was lost all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they were won. And now every lawyer in America is required to study the case law of the Supreme Court, all done by that guy, Fred Gray. One of the greatest icons of the civil rights movement, and he's part of your story. He was preaching full time. The whole time he was arguing those cases, in front of the Supreme Court, travel around to different churches of Christ in that area. I go on and on about him. It's an amazing story. He's still alive. He's 88. One of the last civil rights leaders that still is alive. He wrote a book. It's called Bus Ride to Justice. I encourage you to take a look at some of the pictures in there. Well, the front one will tell you enough. <clears throat> I had a chance to interview him. That magazine is that interview. I was sitting with history. You ever done that? This is way better than my 7 o'clock class, let me tell you. <laughs> Man remembers everything, sharp as can be. I'm supposed to be done, aren't I? Keep going. Mm -hmm. I'm not done yet. I still got four or five minutes. Yeah. And that's just before you even get to the preacher's time. Yeah. <laughs> what am I telling you this for? Because he's a restoration movement guy. And all of those things when he that formed in his head, where do you think it came from? That, that segregation was bad. That God loves everybody the same. That we all need to be treated equally. That we all play a part in the body of Christ and we need each other. Where did that come from? How about maybe John 17? That they may all be one. As I'm in you and you're in me, that they'll all be one. That the world will know that you sent me. This is what our heart beats this is who you are. We don't need to be separated anymore. We don't need to have walls like that Berlin Wall between us. I, that's one of the things I love about the Solomon Foundation is that they've made it about tearing those walls down. There's so many things that don't need to divide us anymore. I don't know if you know this, but the Restoration Movement was established as a unity movement. It was never supposed to be a collection of churches. It was always supposed to be a movement in the church. People uniting around a simple thought, and that is the restoration of the church the way it was in the first century. Where do you think all those mottos came from? We do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible things by Bible names, right? We're not the only Christians, but we're what? We're Christians only. Where do those things come from? 
Art and Stone is one of my favorites. Let Christian unity be our polar star. If you want to know what the restoration movement is, and if I'm up here defining what the restoration movement is, it is to seek for the unity of the body of Christ based on the tenets of the purity of the New Testament. That's what it is. That God's Word is our what? Only rule of faith and practice. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we're silent. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. There are so many things that don't need to divide us anymore. Race doesn't need to divide us. The needs. That all needs to be over in our churches. It needs to be over in our hearts. Denominations and creeds and missionary societies that used to divide us in the past, that's all over. We agree that there's no creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. No name but the divine. We hold that we can be in unity while celebrating our autonomy. We baptize by immersion into the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And we say, whosoever will may come. We believe the Bible is God's Word without error. And it is our only rule of faith and practice. And we are a unity movement. So I pastor a big church made up of 12 locations in a fairly forgotten area that's about 165 miles wide. And it keeps me busy. But it was these incredible stories that I was discovering that brought me to something I never would have expected. Doug alluded to it. See, after my Hannibal discovery, I started telling those stories at the board meetings. Boy, that got me into trouble. Who would have thought that five or six years later, someone would approach the Solomon Foundation saying that unless they stepped in to save Christian Standard and Lookout Magazine, they were going to be gone forever. Our board said, nope. And then some key people approached me about being the publisher. I said, I'm not quitting my day job. And they said, okay. And now I get to tell stories like this all the time. One last story, okay? You've been doing really good. There's only about three of you back there in the back sleeping, and I appreciate that. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> when, we, when we purchased... Christian Standard in the Lookout. Doug's daughter, Renee, called me and said, we're spending $210 a month on this storage unit. I don't know what's in a bunch of junk, but we, just, we need to get rid of this bill, get it off our books, clean it up. So I called some of the other guys that were in, it was in Cincinnati, and I had to drive seven hours to get there, and I called these other guys, and I said, hey, would you meet me there? I'll bring a truck, and... We'll throw stuff away. Once I opened it, it's like being somewhere in between Raiders of the Lost Ark and National Treasure. <laughs> Our entire history was inside there. Christian Standards goes back to 1866, particularly uh, uh, April of 1866. The first edition of the Christian Standard was the eulogy that Isaac Errett wrote on the death of Alexander Campbell. It was the front page. Little tiny, teeny print. And all of those magazines, every week they were printed, starting in 1866, were preserved and bound together in boxes in that storage unit. Every lookout, going back to 1887. 
original oil painting of Isaac Errett and his son, Russell Errett, the first two editors. I found the original prospectus of the Christian Baptist, 1823, signed by Alexander Campbell in his own hand. I found the prospectus of the Millennial Harbinger, the first one. They're framed now. I found the letters that Lucretia Garfield wrote Jenny Errett. Yeah, she's the First Lady of the United States on morning stationery. They're framed too now. All the first editions of the books that Standard Publishing printed. And a million other things. Our entire history. And if Solomon Foundation hadn't said yes, that would have all gone to a dumpster. Why am I telling you that? Because story is important. Do you think right now, are you content with you living your life and dying and nobody remembering who you were or what you did? Do you think that your life boils down to a hyphen between two numbers on a piece of granite? Is that it? Or is there more to your life? Is there more to your story? Are you working at your job at a church because it puts food on the table and it pays the rent? Keeps the lease up to date on your car? Or do you believe in your heart you could probably get a better job that was a lot less headache and heartache? But there is no better job than to work for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There isn't one. One time I read something that, that all that a pastor of a church can do is look down with disdain on all the people that don't know the lofty riches of working with Jesus Christ. That's who you are. That's your story. It's got rough chapters in it. It's got bad chapters, right? Things that you'd like to probably not have in there, but that's part of who you are. And your church has a story. Incredible story. And it has its hardships, its blemishes, its brokenness, its pain, its tears, just like you have. But put it all together. Put all your stories and all of our church's stories, you put them all together. And you know what you have? You have a pretty epic story. <clears throat> and as I close, I know people make a big fuss out of this. <coughs> like how hard it is to share your faith. Well, sharing your faith isn't hard at all. Matter of fact, one of them, you, you only share two things. And one of them you're an expert at. Matter of fact, you're the best expert in the whole world. Did you know that? You only need to share two things. One is your story, and one is His. Because that's all the gospel is. All the gospel is is a story. It's just the story of the Lord Jesus. And all your story is, is how a life got changed because of that story. Because those two stories came together right? Well, that's all sharing the gospel is. That's all evangelism is. It's just sharing his story and your story. And your story is an illustration of his story. And put all those together and you've got God's amazing story. What he's done in our movement and what he's going to do in our movement is more than words or tongue can tell. And you get to be a part of that. So don't let the restoration movement bore you anymore. Because all I did was skip a rock across the top of the lake. And it is deep. And it is wide. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for all of the men and women 
boys and girls that you've inspired over the years to carry the timeless message of your word. Give you praise. And thank you, Father, for inviting us and including us. And if by chance we participate in the fellowships of your suffering, we'll thank God for it. In Jesus' name, amen.